before you start the campaign, you'll need to choose the four characters which make up the party, or the free company as they're called. There are 12 characters to choose from, each with their own unique abilities, equipment and characteristics. In addition, each character comes in two flavours. There's the full character, which includes all the bells and whistles, such as a player board and a hand of seven ability cards. There's also a lightweight version of each character, referred to as a companion. Companions are generally just as powerful as full characters, but they're simplified and streamlined in a number of ways. Notably, instead of ability cards, they have just a few relatively simple abilities to choose from, which makes them faster to play than full characters. If you have fewer than four players, and you don't want to manage four full characters, you can use companions to fill in the gaps, so that the free company always has four characters. Companions are still referred to as Oathsworn, and they still participate in all aspects of the game. We'll look more closely at companions later in this video series. When it comes to choosing your starting characters, the rulebook gives each character a complexity rating from 1 to 5 stars. If you're playing Oathsworn for the first time, it's a good idea to choose characters with no more than 3 stars, since their abilities tend to be a bit more straightforward. As opposed to 5 star characters, like the Witch, who can spread fire and water tiles onto the game board, affecting both allies and enemies, as well as providing fuel for spellcasting. Wicked. Also, despite the temptation of her cool miniatures, the Grove Maiden character is off-limits, until you unlock her at some point in the campaign. Besides the complexity ratings, you might want to check out the character descriptions on the back of each player board, when choosing the members of your free company. I should also mention that you don't necessarily have to stick with the same four characters throughout the entire campaign, as there are some optional rules for swapping characters in and out. They even include rules for switching a character from a companion to the full version, or vice versa, which is ideal for groups with a variable player count, or as a way of ramping up the complexity once you've mastered the rules. In addition to full characters and lightweight companions, the game also includes a number of allies. These aren't Oathsworn, and they aren't part of the Free Company, but they have various roles in the game, such as coming to the rescue when one of the company gets knocked out in battle. Mechanically, allies are a lot like companions, but simplified even further. You can also adjust the difficulty level of the game. The standard difficulty is called Free Company, and involves setting the hit point dice to their maximum on both Oathsworn and allies. Other difficulty levels can affect hit point dice, defense values, rewards, and scoring, so you'll need to refer to the rulebook. Fortunately, you can adjust the difficulty if you need to before the start of each chapter. For the upcoming battle, I'm going to choose two full characters, the Adendri Ranger and the Scar Tribe Exile. I'll need to leave space around the edges of the player boards for placing cards into the cooldown positions. That's what those white numbers on each edge signify. And to fill out the rest of the free company, I've chosen the Priest and the Ursus Warbear as companions. At the start of the campaign, the story rulebook will show you how to set up the components you'll need. Each character gets a few components, including a character sheet, some pocket money, and some item cards. Before we set up the player boards, let's get a handle on item cards. At the start of the campaign, each character comes equipped with a predetermined set of two or three items, so you can't go wrong. They're listed near the start of the story rulebook. For example, the priest starts with a great maul and a pig iron coat. As the game progresses, you'll acquire more items, and you'll have to choose which ones to equip. There are quite strict limits on the number of items you can equip. Just below the item's name, you'll find a list of keywords, including, amongst other things, the item's type, such as a weapon, armour, shield, or gear. Each Oathsworn can equip at most one armour item, one gear item, and up to two hands worth of weapon and shield items. The priest, for example, has both hands full, with the two-handed Great Maw, and his armour slot is taken by the pig iron coat which leaves just one slot for a gear item when he finds one. Also, keep in mind that not every character can wield every type of weapon, shield or armour. You'll find a list of valid item types at the bottom of each character board. For example, the ranger can equip a bow, but the exile can't. Conveniently, the same information is also shown in the form of character icons running down the right hand side of the relevant item cards. For example, this item can be equipped by the exile, the Priest, the Ursus, and a couple of others. 
Naturally, if there are no icons, then any character can use it. Once your Oathsworn is equipped, any excess items go into the shared backpack. We'll get more familiar with item cards later, but for now I'll just point out this number at the bottom of each card, and on the back. That's both the chapter number, and also the cost if you buy it from the Banksmith. Now let's take a look at the player boards. The space in the corner is for tracking your hit points, so we'll place one of the red HP dice here and set it to 6 since we're on normal difficulty. That'll count down as we take damage. These four spaces are called the Might Track. You place coloured cubes here to reflect all the might bonuses you get from your equipped items, usually from weapons. The Might Track helps you access the coloured might cards and might dice, which are more powerful than the white cards. Obviously you'll use your might track during combat, but you sometimes use it during the story part of a chapter as well, either for a skirmish, which is a short single round of combat, or for a might check, which is usually some test of physical prowess. But for now, let's populate the might track on each of our characters. The priest is wielding a great maul, so he gets one yellow might cube for that. The ranger also gets one yellow cube for her short bow. The Exile has a hatchet in each hand, but sadly neither have a might bonus, so the might track on his player board remains empty. And finally, the Ursus Warbear gets one yellow cube from her felling axe. To the right of the might track is the defence slot. It's similar to the might track, but it reflects the defence values from all your equipped items, usually shields or armour. The defence icon is a blue shield with a number on it, so just add up the defence values from your item cards and put a black token on the defence slot to record the total. That's called a tracker token by the way. So the ranger is wearing tattered rawhide wrappings, which give her a defence value of 2, and the exile has committed a major fashion faux pas by wearing the exact same outfit. The Ursus is stepping out in a pig iron coat with a defence of 3, but notice that companions always get a defence bonus of plus 2, as shown on the card. So her total defence is 5. And the priest is exactly the same. The defence slot can never go below 1 by the way. Now that we've recorded all our might and defence bonuses on the player boards, we won't accidentally overlook any of them in the heat of battle. I think it's a neat system, setting that up at the beginning of each play session. You can think of the might track and defence slot as passive bonuses, because they remain with you, provided none of your equipped items get dropped, destroyed, or placed in your backpack. Since items come and go throughout the campaign, it's worth occasionally double checking that the player boards and companion cards are accurately reflecting the equipped items, especially at the start of a battle. At the bottom of each character board is a space for Animus. Animus gems are much like action points in other board games. Most actions, such as moving or attacking, require you to spend Animus by moving them from the available area on the right to the reserve or spent area on the left. Note that each character has two stats associated with Animus. The first is their maximum Animus, which is the total number of Animus gems on their character board. The maximum animus for each character at the start of the campaign is printed on their character board. The other animus stat is the regen value, which is the number of gems which get regenerated at the start of each round of combat. Regenerating animus is just the opposite of spending it, in other words, moving it back into the available area. Now, the maximum animus and the regen value will change independently over the course of the campaign, so be sure to keep track of both of them on the character sheet. The starting regen value is actually printed on the player board, so obviously you'll need to use a tracker token if it goes above that. Sadly, whenever you're setting up a player board at the start of a session, you have to put all the animus in the reserve area on the left. So let's give the ranger her 7 animus gems, and the exile gets 8. Companions also use animus tokens, but they always have a maximum of 2 animus and a regen value of 2 and that won't change over the course of the campaign. Two Animus doesn't seem like much, but as you can see on the companion card, they have their own exchange rates when it comes to using Animus, so a little goes a long way. And that's it for the introduction to our free company. In the next video, we'll introduce stories, encounters, and ability cards.